right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Southwestern Indiana Historical Society's um, lecture this evening. We have a special guest. This is Dr. Michael Straziski. He is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Southern Indiana. Um, he has done excavations in New Harmony, um, as well as outside of Lafayette at Fort Weonauten um, and, and some other places as well, but those are two that are near and dear to my heart. Um, today, though, he's here to talk to us about something a little bit unrelated to that in some ways. Um, so he's going to teach us all about the history of the tavern in New Harmony. So, Mike, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay. All right, I'll just share the screen here. Um, there we go. How's that look? Good, okay. Um, so yes, um, I'm at USI. I'm the archeology span person at, at, at USI. And I, as Jennifer mentioned, I've done a lot of excavations in Indiana. I work primarily in this state. Uh, most people think of archeology, span they don't think of Indiana, but uh, that's my that's my territory. Um, but this talk is not actually about archaeology. Um, it's it's more of a history sort of talk based on documents rather than digging in the ground and artifacts. Um, and you'll see uh, why that's the case as I go along here. Um, but uh, this is a this is a uh, project that I started working on when I was in Greece visiting my in-laws. My wife's from Greece. And we were visiting the in-laws and I always like to uh, find something to keep me busy while I'm there. <laughs> and so what better thing to keep yourself busy with than transcribing 19th century documents, of course, right? Um, but that's, you know, I spent a lot of time working on that and this is the kind of the fruit of this. Um, just FYI, I've turned this into a book chapter and there's an edited volume coming out, hopefully not too much longer on uh, New Harmony and some of the various uh, aspects of it written by various authors. And I have a chapter in the book uh, on the, uh, the Harmonist Tavern. So as you can see here, uh, I've called it, you know, an excellent house of private entertainment, the Harmonist Tavern in New Harmony, 1815 to 1825. So we're talking about, you know, of course, the very first settlers in this area of European, that is, uh, of background. Um, frontier Taverns, a little bit about Frontier Taverns. Um, they varied in, in quality. Uh, essentially, uh, what we had was a, a situation in the early 19th century where uh, travelers uh, oftentimes needed a place to stay overnight. Uh, the, the roads uh, were, you know, less than adequate. Sometimes we're talking about a little more than a trail. Um, and if you're stuck in the middle of between point and a point, Point A and point B uh, in the middle of the, uh, you know, as it's starting to get dark out, you're going to try to find a place to sleep uh, rather than sleeping out under the stars. Um, so frontier taverns were a place where people could stop and, and find lodging and uh, find uh, 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 some food and some drink for the evening. Um, now, when we use the term tavern today, we tend to think of just alcohol consumption, but um, a tavern in the early 19th century is more like what we might call an inn today. Um, it was a place where you could actually sleep as well. Now, these things uh, varied in formality. Uh, usually the ones that are kind of in between destinations. Uh, if you had a house along the main road, somebody could just kind of knock at your door at the end of the evening and say like, knock, knock, you know, I'm looking for a place to stay. Do you have any, you know, can you take in borders for the night? And they might say yes, and they give you whatever food they have on hand, and then you'd give them a few, you know, uh, you know, some payment for 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 your stay that evening. Like I said, very informal. And then when you get to some of the larger towns and that sort of thing, you would have like a more a business that was kind of dedicated to that to that whole enterprise, where you would actually have a, a separate room, and you know, there'd be more meals uh, performed for or uh, uh, served for 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 lodgers, right? Uh, so, like I said, the accommodations varied greatly in terms of what you could expect from one of these uh, taverns. There's a couple of illustrations I'll show you here of frontier taverns. This is one from a book from 1821, written by a fellow named Adler Web Welby, uh, who was traveling. It's a travel account type thing. Um, and this is a, a 
illustration, which he says is Log Tavern, comma, Indiana, right? And you can see there's a little sign out in front there that says Tavern on the right. And so maybe perhaps this was one that was a bit more of a formal business. Um, this is an illustration by Charles Alexander the Soar from uh, 1826. Uh, this was a tavern operated by a fellow by the name of William Hall in Wamboro, Illinois, which is near Albion in southern India, uh, southern Illinois. Um, and you can see it's pretty much just a double wide, uh, not double wide, but double pen uh, log cabin with a with a porch on the front. Here's a sketch that uh, Lesour did of from the tavern itself, looking out on the landscape, and you can see they've got the table set there, uh, you know, glasses and pitchers and what have you on the table people getting ready to eat or having just finished eating. It looks rather relaxing. Um, but uh, there's not a whole lot of accounts. Well, there's a fair number, but you know, there, there, many of these accounts um, are not terribly, let's say, uh, uh, flattering in terms of the quality of the accommodations. And I'll give you a few examples here um, that, that kind of illustrate that point. Uh, this is a, a, a comments from a fellow by the name of William Foe, uh, who was in Albion, Illinois in 1818. And here's what he had to say about the accommodations. He said, I supped and went to bed in a hog sty of a room containing four filthy beds and eight mean persons, the sheets stinking and dirty, Scarcity of water, I suppose, is the cause. The beds lie on boards, not cords, and are so hard I could not sleep. Three in one bed, all filth, no comfort, and yet this is an English tavern. The settlers were from England. No whiskey, no milk, and vile tea in this land of prairies. Uh, so, you know, one star, right, basically. Um, here's another one by Adler Welby talking about English prairie. He said, our own fare proved little better than that of our horses, which spoke volumes on the state of the settlement. Some very rancid butter, a little sour bread, and some slices of lean fried beef, which it was vain to expect the teeth could penetrate, right? <laughs> so washed down by bad coffee, sweetened with wild honey, formed our repast. <laughs> Milk, sugar, salt, the answer to all was we have none. Now, this one's my favorite one. This is from a tavern near Louisville in Indiana, on the Indiana side. <clears throat> William Foe says, my hostess would in England pass for a witch, having a singularly long, <clears throat> yellow, haggish, dirty face and complexion. <clears throat> Here is a pet bear. They had a pet bear at the tavern. One of these pets recently broke its chain and came into the house where lay a sick and bedridden man and an infant child on the floor, which the the bear, much pleased, marched off. So the bear grabbed the baby. The poor old man suddenly acquired supernatural strength, sprung out and running after the bear, threw him down, rescued the screaming babe, unhugged and unhurt, and then jumped into bed again. <laughs> so yeah, it sounds like pretty colorful uh, lodgings. Um, uh, that, that, and, and you know what, we may, we may be biased towards uh, uh, towards uh, descriptions of, of lodging that were particularly poor. That is, you know, the people who are traveling didn't remark, oh yeah, this was pretty good lodging. They only said something when it was lousy, as you might guess, with, you know, from reading reviews today online or something like that. It's kind of the equivalent of that. Um, so now to the Harmonist Tavern in New Harmony. Um, for those of you, if anybody is not familiar with New Harmony, I assume most of you are, but um, we're talking about a German religious group uh, under the leadership of George Rapp, this fellow shown here. Um, and in Germany, uh, they came up against some persecution uh, in, in, as they were in defiance of the, the, the Lutheran church uh, and eventually decided to emigrate, come to the United States where, in 1805, uh, where they set up their first town in Western Pennsylvania. Now they, uh, after a period of time there, they decided they were gonna move uh, where they came to uh, what's uh, now Indiana, but at the time was the Indiana Territory. It was a couple of years before statehood. And the first harmonists arrived in Indiana in 1814. Now, upon their arrival, um, they started building a town, building facilities for themselves. But one of the things that they realized they needed right away was tavern. Um, so uh, George Rapp, the, like I said, the, the leader of the harmonists, writes to his uh, adopted son in Pennsylvania saying that they needed a tavern because strangers often come late at night and then we have no bed. We must build a double log cabin for this purpose, right? 
So they said right away that this is one of the things we absolutely need. Um, so here's the building. This is it. There are some photos. This one's in the USI archives, uh, courtesy of Jennifer. Um, but um, this is a photo of the Harmonious Tavern building in uh, 1903. It's hard to read because I got the zoom controls right over the <laughs> caption there. Um, but this tavern uh, was considered uh, by a number of people or was remarked upon as being one of the best ones that they had stayed in in Indiana. Um, here's just a couple of quotes. An excellent house of private entertainment is kept by one of their number named Frederick Eckensberger. He was the tavern keeper, the harmless tavern keeper. Everything here was so clean, comfortable, and well arranged that I was quite delighted. You know, it was a big surprise considering what they had uh, come across uh, in other places. Uh, Thomas Holm in 1819 said, having refreshed ourselves at the tavern where we found everything we wanted for ourselves and our horses, and all very clean and nice, besides many good things we did not expect, such as beer, porter, and even wine, all made within the society and very good indeed, all right? Uh, so what was it like to stay in the Harmonious Tavern? Here's a few, a uh, couple of uh, remarks upon that. Uh, Foe says in 1819, I slept in a good, clean bedroom, four beds in a room, one in each corner, but found bad beef, not a fan of the beef, uh, though good bread and high charges, $1.05 each. So he thought it was a bit overpriced perhaps, but otherwise he thought it was pretty good, it seems. Uh, at Welby again in 1819 says, uh, it was neatness itself, but furnished in the very plainest manner and beyond a three-cornered armchair, there was not a piece of furniture which could excite the repose of indolence or the indulgence of luxury. After a plain, plain repast accompanied, however, with some good beer and a bottle of white wine, both the produce of the colony, All right? So he thought, you know, everything was a bit plain, but, you know, not bad, clean, comfortable, etc. cetera. Um, and and, and to, to, to mention here, the harmonists themselves, the, the members of the society, uh, did lead very simple lives without any or very, very few luxuries on their part. And so apparently that ethos kind of extended to the, the tavern as well for, for the outsiders. Um, this is a map showing, uh, it's an 1824 map that was uh, drawn by a guy named William Pickering, um, and this was uh, drafted when the harmonists were uh, going to sell their town. They decided to sell their town and move back to Pennsylvania. So this was a map that was drafted in order to help the sale of the town. Um, and you can see uh, the tavern located uh, in this portion of the map that I'm showing you right in the center there. Um, and the tavern is situated pretty much right in the center of town. It's on Main Street and Tavern Street, uh, which is still called Tavern Street, even though the tavern's not there anymore. Um, but it's right uh, at, the, at uh, kind of the commercial center of town. Um, you can see uh, uh, to, the, to the southeast, you've got the Harmonist store, uh, the warehouse, the doctor's office where harmonists and non-harmonists could receive medical care. There's a wheelwright's uh, shop and a blacksmith shop there. Um, these are all places that would be like, you know, point of contact between the Harmony Society and the outside world. You know, generally the harmonists were rather insular people. They were not, you know, uh, working with outsiders a whole lot. Most of them just didn't even speak English. Uh, but this is one of the few places, this kind of sector of town was a place where there was some contact between the society and the outside world, so to speak. Um, this is a map that I just put together using Pickering's map to kind of a little bit better explain as what's going on there. Um, you can see on the bottom right uh, that that's the tavern itself, the building, that frame building that I showed you. Just to the west of that is a brick building a uh, two-story brick building um, that I don't know the function of. I am going to guess it was probably a couple options or both perhaps uh, a kitchen for the tavern, that is where the meals were prepared uh, and or um, the residence of, of Frederick Atkinsberger. To the, to the west of that or to the, to the left um, is the, uh, the stables, and then uh, towards the northwest corner of the lot, you've got a smokehouse and a shed, and then a garden um, that was used uh, almost certainly to provide uh, produce for meals 
uh, within the tavern. I don't know the specific use of the different rooms that are shown in the map there. That's not specified at all, but I'm assuming some of them were dedicated to sleeping quarters, uh, eating, um, food preparation, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, here's a drawing. This is uh, by uh, Charles Alexander Lesur again. I showed you one of his drawings earlier, a couple of his drawings earlier, um, and it shows exactly that corner. Um, this, uh, the Harmonists themselves called it the Wirtshaus, uh, basically a guest house. Um, there was apparently a sign on the building called, that said it was for private entertainment. I'm pretty sure that sign, or I'm virtually certain that that sign was put out there to uh, keep uh, drunken people out of the tavern. That is, this is, you're here as my guest. If I don't want you here, you can get out. Um, the Harmonists were not fans of, uh, of drunkenness, um, and they kind of, as we'll see later, um, kind of ran into some issues with that sort of thing. Another thing to point out was the Harmonist Tavern was not for Harmonists. Uh, they did not drink hard alcohol. They drank beer and wine and that sort of thing, uh, but did not drink hard alcohol. And they didn't mix it up with the locals either. So um, this was purely for outsiders, uh, entertainment and, uh, and or lodging for those who had official business in town. Um, so what you're seeing here is the tavern itself. Um, some of the other buildings that can identify in this drawing, we've got the brick structure that I mentioned that uh, was abutting the, the tavern. We've got uh, some of the other buildings that are shown on that map, the stable, the shed, and the smokehouse, uh, possibly there, all those three. Uh, and then the school, the Harmonist School, which is across the street, is probably that building that's shown at that other roof, uh, the edge of the roof there. Um, here's what happened to the tavern. You may ask, is it still standing today? Um, no, sorry, it is not. Unfortunately, it burned down in 1908, taking with it a number of buildings and some residences. So apparently it was described as a devastating fire, but that was what's left of the tavern. So not much. Um, the other question you might have is, well, can you do archaeology on that spot to try to find the tavern or any remains of the tavern or any artifacts related to the use of the tavern? Um, and the answer to that question is probably not uh, in that regard as well. Um, this is the building that currently stands on the, uh, on the tavern lot. Um, and as you can see, that's you know, pretty substantial construction there, and it almost certainly impacted severely uh, any archaeological remains that are there. There may be some remains related to the smokehouse and perhaps the brick building, but um, it's all in private hands and I haven't actually, you know, checked to see if there's anything. It's a bit of a, be a bit of a crapshoot to see if you could uh, find anything uh, related to the tavern. So um, I haven't risked it <laughs> yet to see if I could find anything. All right, so studying transfer, uh, frontier taverns, how are we going to approach this question? Well, we can approach it from an archaeological uh, uh, perspective. That is, you know, you can dig in the ground, find artifacts, you find features related to a tavern, you know, foundation walls and what have you. Um, and so there have been some excavations of taverns uh, done in Illinois. I don't think there's any that have been done in Indiana, uh, but there's some information out there from archaeological sources. Um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that's not really possible in New Harmony. So that's not much of a chance of doing any archaeology there. The other uh, angle you can take is a historical one that is looking at uh, historical documents related to taverns. Um, so I've given you some uh, information from travelers' accounts and that sort of thing. Those tend to be a bit, as I said, perhaps biased towards negative experiences. Um, you know, there's it's not uh, there's not all the information there that you could possibly want. You know, you just get you know more complaints than anything else. Um, and then um, the other uh, possibility is is if you could find uh, some documents related to the operation of the tavern. That is, if you've got some ledgers or something like that uh, related to a tavern operation. There are a few of those out there. Uh, there's a few kind of small piecemeal documents here and there for taverns in Indiana, for example, but there's really not a heck of a lot uh, available to sort of piece together what the tavern operation was all about. So when I came across all of the documents for the Harmonist Tavern on microfilm at the Workingmen's Institute, New Harmony, I thought this is a kind of juicy bits of information here that can be used to you know, really reconstruct what this tavern was all about. Um, so here's what we've got 
uh, as far as the tavern is concerned. Now, the harmonists were meticulous record keepers. They kept track of every penny they spent. Um, and this is from uh, the um, harmonist uh ledger for the tavern and you can see frederick eckensberger's name up there at the top and then you've got a column on the left where it says dr that's the debit column and you've got a column on the right that's the cr that's the credit column so that's what we have we don't have like a list of patrons or how much they paid or you know anything like that you know it's, it's not everything we could possibly want but it's a heck of a lot to be honest um, so this is like I said when I was in Greece, uh, you know, sitting on the couch, um, I transcribed all of these documents. And you can see, for example, if you look at the top of this, it says October 19th, and it says three pounds of butter and four dozen eggs, 70 cents. November 4th, two fish, one dollar. And that says one GPBRD, that's one gallon of peach brandy. You know, I get to uh, you look enough at these things, you can begin to figure out what the heck they're all about. But that was 225. November 13th, four gallons of whiskey for four bucks. Uh, November 14th, four pounds of butter at 12 and a half cents a pound for 50 cents, you know, that kind of thing. So I went through all these documents and I created a database with all this information so I could start querying the database to try to find some patterns in what was going on. Um, so what I, you know, figured out from doing this is that the last entry in Harmony, Pennsylvania, their first town was in February 1815. And then the Harmonist Tavern in New Harmony was in operation, or at least the expenses show that it was in operation from June of 1815 through April of 1825, very close to 10 years. Um, and they found there was a, a th over a thousand entries during that time of expenses. Um, and then the tavern switches back to Pennsylvania when they move out of Indiana. And by June of 1825, it's operating back in Pennsylvania again. So we've got a nice little neat 10 year thing, but it, it pretty much runs the whole span of that 10 year time frame uh, uh, with, with detailed lists of everything that was purchased. All right, so after crunching the numbers, you know, you start to look for patterns, of course, to, to, to start talking about what this tavern was all about and how it was operated. Um, one of the things, kind of basic thing here was that the tavern had decent business throughout the year. It wasn't a seasonal thing, apparently. There's a little bit of a hump there in the summer, you can see. Um, but, you know, they're doing fairly decent business in, you know, January and March as, as well. So uh, it was a, a year round uh, thing. All right, a little bit about some of the things that were being served in the tavern. Now, what was what were the most popular drinks at that time? Um, you know, and, and I'll have to say first of all that you know the Harmonist Tavern was not your ordinary tavern. You know, operated by a uh, early settler. These were you know a religious group. They had their own beliefs about alcohol consumption and who they were going to serve and who they didn't want to serve and all that kind of thing. So we can't really treat it as like a typical tavern for pioneer era uh indiana but nonetheless it's pretty great information here one of the things that was being served at the tavern was beer now beer wasn't a big part of american alcohol consumption until after the civil war there's issues with like you got to keep it cool the spoilage issues and stuff like that uh, but the harmonists were from germany they had a beer making tradition and they made beer and this is an ad actually from a uh, newspaper in vincennes um that shows uh the beer being you know for sale uh, ad uh in in the newspaper there now if beer was first offered at the harmonist tavern in 1819 and oddly enough the very first beer that for the evidence that i have of the beer being brewed in new harmony was from mid 1818 so once they started making their own beer that became the main thing that they were serving in the tavern um they were selling about 457 gallons a year of beer a heck of a lot of beer being sold. Um, and it was sold for uh, $5 per half barrel. So 16 gallons is a half barrel. Um, and like I said, about $5 per half barrel. Um, the tavern took up about 20% of the society's production of beer um, with the remainder sold elsewhere. Right? Uh, one year, in fact, in 1820, uh, a large chunk of the beer that was being made in New Harmony was sold to the English Prairie Settlement. People from England, they also had a tradition of beer making, beer consumption, and I could trace 
a large number of the people that were buying beer that year back to the English Prairie, known individuals who were part of that settlement. So that was, you know, uh, they were one of their main customers as far as beer is concerned. Wine uh, was another matter. Um, uh, Frederick, uh, uh, George Rapp, the leader of the Harmony Society, uh, was a, a, a wine dresser. He was involved in the wine business back in Germany. So when he came to the United States, one of the things he wanted to do was to start wine production here in the U.S. Um, and wine is just was never, never really a super popular beverage in uh, alcoholic beverage in the United States um, for quite some time. Um, and so there wasn't a huge market for it here. Um, wine at that time was often served as fortified wine. That is, you would add distilled spirits to the wine to beef up the alcohol content. Um, in the tavern, some of the wine that was sold there is known to have been harmonist wine. There are some entries where they say H wine, and that's harmonist wine. Um, they don't specify red or white or anything like that in the ledger, unfortunately, so I don't have any, any uh, info on that particular question. There are some imported wines that are mentioned. There's one called Tenerife, which is from the Canary Islands. There's Lisbon wine, apparently Portuguese wine. Uh, those were more expensive than the other wines that were being sold. Um, but overall, there wasn't a heck of a lot of wine sold in New Harmony, very modest sales, which says something to the tastes of the local folks, uh, the you know, Posey County residents. They weren't really terribly interested in drinking wine. So it was about 16 gallons per year on average of wine being uh, sold. So again, crunch the numbers, that's only 3.5% that of beer. So much, much less wine than beer. Uh, one other thing, and this is if you know anything about alcohol in the early uh, Republic, cider was a big part of it. And when they say cider in those ledgers, they mean hard, what we would call hard cider, right? As opposed to just, you know, apple juice uh, type cider without any alcohol. Cider was a very popular drink in the early Republic um, because of, uh, there was a glut of apples in this area. Now, what happened was the pioneer folks come to the, you know, come to what's now Indiana, they start cutting down trees, planting fields. And one of the things they're planting are apple trees. Now, after a few years, those apple trees start producing lots and lots of apples. Now, what are you gonna do with all these apples? Well, roads are terrible. Apples are prone to spoilage. They're heavy. It's gonna cost you a lot of money to transport the apples. What am I gonna do with all these apples? Well, one thing you can do with them is squeeze them down into apple juice, ferment that and turn it into cider. Um, so it was, Cider was seen also as a, um, a patriotic thing to drink because it was locally made stuff, you know, U.S. Uh, made uh, beverage, alcoholic beverage, had about 10% alcohol, a little bit more than, um, than beer. Sometimes this was also fortified. That is, like I said, you know, you put the distilled spirits into it, and that was oftentimes called cider royal. Uh, that shows up on the Harmonist ledgers a couple of times. Um, at the tavern, not super popular. Apparently, it was only purchased in four out of the 10 years. So some folks were drinking cider, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, the most popular uh, lower alcohol drink. Now, as we get to the higher alcohol stuff, it's, you know, there's a little bit of a different story there. Whiskey is the uh, the uh, drink of choice uh, when it comes to distilled spirits. It was the biggest selling distilled spirit in the early Republic. Um, and it, depending on how many times you ran it through the distillation process, you could beef the alcohol content up, um, but it, uh, it somewhere around 45% or so alcohol in uh, this whiskey. Now this is not aged whiskey, by the way, this is stuff that's coming out of the distiller and then whisked off to uh, whomever likes to drink it. I'm gonna guess it probably tastes more like rubbing alcohol than anything. But, uh, so, you know, we're not talking about finely aged uh, spirits or anything like that. This one was also uh, seen as a patriotic thing to drink because in this case, it was made with locally grown corn, right? So again, lots of farmers, what am I gonna do with all this corn? Transportation routes are terrible. Why don't we take this corn and turn it into alcohol? Um, and so, it was 
you know, like I said, a, a locally made thing, go US, we're going to drink whiskey instead of rum. What, where did rum come from? Well, it comes from molasses and, you know, the things that it comes from, uh, which, which is made in the, in the, in the Indies, East Indies or West Indies, sorry, um, which is under British control, right? We don't want to support that economy. We want to support our own economy. And so we're going to drink whiskey instead. So what happened was, is you get a huge, let me just uh, tell you these numbers here first before I go on to the next one. You get a huge glut of whiskey too. Um, so I just got some numbers here. Um, so in 1812, now this is two years before the harmonists arrived, in New Orleans, they got 11,000 gallons of whiskey coming down the river, right? That's 1812. By 1816, four years later, there was 320,000 gallons of whiskey. And then by 1825, there was 570,000 gallons of whiskey coming down the river to New Orleans. So this was a major product being made in this kind of interior area of the United States going from 11,000 to 570,000 gallons in only 13 years. Um, so the Harmonists, they made whiskey in Pennsylvania. And when they came here to, um, to Indiana, they set up a distillery right away. And this is actually from that uh, Pickering map shows the distillery. Uh, there was two of them actually in town. This is the one on the uh, north. I'm sorry, this is the one on the south side of uh, of, uh, of, of town, kind of the southwest side of town is where it was located. Uh, there's other harder alcohols uh, that are being sold, sold at the tavern. There's some Persico, which is like a, I'm sorry, a peach brandy. There's regular brandy, there's gin, rum, but they're very, very small amounts of these other hard alcohol type drinks. Whiskey is just, you know, number one. Okay, so a few things about whiskey. Um, whiskey prices drop through time. No big surprise there, right? Um, when the Harmonists first came to, to Posey County, they were just, they, they had to buy whiskey. They knew that people wanted it, but they had to purchase it from outside until they got their own stuff running. Um, but there was a lot of demand for whiskey. And you can see when they first came, it was about a dollar a gallon, which is a steal for us, but right, you know, a dollar a gallon. But the prices continued to go down, 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 down to about 1821, you were getting less than 40 cents a gallon for, for whiskey. Um, now, here's where we get back to, uh, to talking about um, New Harmony specifically. Um, when I started looking at the numbers, uh, there was a very strange pattern that came about. What you can see here in this, in this um, graph is that the whiskey sales start out rather modest, 1815, 1816. We've got about 50 gallons a year, 1817, even a little less than that. But then by 1818 and 1819, it just goes right through the roof. You've got 200, 250 gallons plus, you know, uh, being sold in those two years. And then but soon after that, boom, it drops off to basically nothing. So by 1821, 1822, et cetera, there's basically no whiskey being sold at the Harmonist Tavern. Now, I thought by myself, like, what the heck is going on here? Why is it that whiskey is so popular at the tavern and then it just drops off to virtually nothing after that? So I'm racking my brain trying to think about what's going on in New Harmony at that time and what could have been causing that. Um, and I, I believe I figured it out. I think that the issue there was that there was a riot in New Harmony. Um, and we'll get to the specifics here, uh, but why this relates back to the, to, the, to the tavern. So what happened was, is that in January of 1820, there was a fellow non-harmonist person named William Harris. He comes into town, gets in a fight with two harmonists, and Frederick Eckensberger, the tavern keeper, is drawn into the fight. There, apparently, there was a dispute over some people that were indentured to the Harmony Society, and there, we don't know any more about the specifics of the why the fight occurred. But then the following day, nine men show up, again, non-harmonists, show up uh, on the outside of town with clubs, sticks, rifles, guns, and other offensive weapons. And they argue with the harmonists and they assault six harmonists. And then later that day, 12 men entered the town and they went basically on a riot for a couple of hours, uh, harassing people. And they went to Eckensberger's home at the tavern and threatened him. So after this, there were a bunch of 
you know, there was charges against the rioters. There was some charges against Eckensberger for assaulting somebody and it went to the courts. And um, it got drawn out for a number of months. A couple of people paid a small fine uh, but the main fellow who was involved, William Harris, uh, just didn't show up for court. And after a few months, the charges were dropped, right? So it didn't really come to much. You know, these people just basically got away with it uh, coming into town and causing a riot in town. So the harmless response to this riot was basically one of resignation. You know, they're, they were just, you know, we can't work with these people. You know, the, these people who are these secular people or these people outside of our society are not going to support us. And they're not thinking the same way we are. We're not going to get proper justice from them. Here's a, here's a couple of quotes. These, and these are related directly to the riot. And this is their response to it. It says, there's no other way for us than to have as little to do with the world as possible. We just don't want to deal with these people, right? Um, and this is uh, Frederick Rapp, uh, Rapp's uh, adoptive son to John Baker, who's another um, harmonist. Um, and he said, we're determined more and more to limit ourselves to ourselves. They're going to turn inward. The world cannot, can no longer bear us and we cannot bear it until it is judged, right? They were, they were trying to set up a model community in, you know, emulation of the early Christians um, in, in coming in, in, in anticipation of Christ's return. And they said, these people outside of our society are, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> we can't deal with them until it is judged. That is until Christ returns, right? So I believe that what the solution they thought was best to prevent any kind of further uh, violence and to perhaps limit their contact with some of the people from outside of the society was to cut off hard liquor sales in the tavern. Um, so kind of to back that up, to back up that assertion, um, on January 7th, and this is two weeks before the riot, they were continuing to buy whiskey. 35, oh, 33 and a half gallons of whiskey were purchased at that time. And then February 24th, a month after, about 32 gallons of whiskey was purchased. Now, once those, those um, uh, decisions came down in the courts, whoosh, that was the end of it. No more whiskey was bought. Between March 21st, or March, uh, March 1821, in April 1825, four years, they bought three gallons of whiskey, right? So they were going from like hundreds of gallons every year to three gallons for a four year period. So it was, you know, cold turkey, basically. They were not going to sell whiskey anymore in the town. Now you may ask, do they continue to make whiskey? Absolutely. They, the wine or the whiskey production never diminished. I don't have all the numbers. I haven't got all the documents to, you know, the, to, to show exactly how much whiskey was being made, but they didn't slow down as far as I can tell, right? Um, here's a letter uh, from Frederick Rapp to one of the people who was inquiring about purchasing some whiskey. And he said that there's an uncommon call for whiskey during a harvest by our neighbors. Apparently the neighbors need a lot of whiskey to, to harvest their crops, whom we could not refuse without offense so that all the new whiskey is now sold to the barrel, right? We got nothing to sell to you because the locals have bought it all, right? So the thing is, is that, you know, they, they didn't have any qualms about selling whiskey, you know, per se. They just didn't want anybody drinking it in town because they thought it was causing conflicts and it was just something they just didn't want to deal with. And so the tavern itself cut off all hard liquor sales, right? Now, as further kind of confirmation of this whole idea, once the harmonists moved back to Pennsylvania in 1825, whiskey sales started right up again, right? 1825 was a partial year. They didn't start till June. They sold 73 gallons of whiskey. 1826, the next year, the first full year in Pennsylvania, 180 gallons of whiskey. So not a problem selling whiskey to people in the tavern as long as they behave themselves. And apparently that was the biggest issue. They, they just couldn't control the Posey County folks uh, in the tavern, right? Now, the bottom line of this is that uh, the, the profits of the tavern suffered, right? As you might guess, you know, because people wanted whiskey. There's no whiskey at this tavern. Why would I go to that tavern, right? They don't allow drunkenness. They don't allow this. They don't allow that. I'm, you know, I'm just going to go somewhere else. So you can see uh, that the profits of the tavern continue to go up from 1815, 16, 17, 18, 19. And then after 1820, when there's that riot, 
starts to go down through 1823. I don't have any numbers for 1824 and 25, so I don't know ultimately what the profits were for those last two years, but you can see a clear pattern there of, uh, of declining sales or declining profits at the Harmonist Tavern, uh, which I think is almost certainly due to hard feelings between the locals, coupled with the fact that they weren't selling whiskey anymore. They weren't giving the people their, the product that they were asking for, right? And that's not, you know, it's not, the bottom line is not good for business, right? When you're not giving people what they ask for. So that's sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the gist of it. Um, and uh, the, the uh, main arguments I've made in this chapter. Um, and I am perfectly willing to take any questions you might have uh, regarding the Harmonist Tavern. So thanks for having me uh, uh, for, for, for doing the talk today. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, do you know where they were selling um, the whiskey they were making that wasn't uh, going to the tavern? Some of it was going to the tavern. A lot of it was being sold elsewhere. I, you know, I haven't dived into all the whiskey and, and beer sales records. There's a lot out there. I mean, if you ever look at the Harmonist records in the Working Men's Institute, there's like 40 reels of microfilm, literally, and thousands and thousands of pages of documents um, related to sales of this and that. Surprisingly, a, long, a large amount of it's in English, which is good for me, of course. Um, but I haven't gone to that extent to find everything related to liquor sales it's it's really complicated to try to nail all that stuff down yeah but not a lot of keyword searching happening with microfilm okay. yeah we do have a question in chat okay. um, do you think the riot was about slavery since the harmonists were abolitionists and most of their neighbors were not slavery you know i i don't know the harvest they they had a few members who were African-American uh, people, the former slaves that they brought in, they weren't terribly vocal about slavery as far as I know one way or the other. I, I don't think it had anything to do with that. I mean, we would, it was some kind of, indentured, like I said, indentured servitude related argument. Another thing that the people were commonly didn't like the harmonists for was the fact that they, uh, operated businesses and they took in all this money from the local economy and they didn't have to pay any workers because they kept it all in the society and they never gave any of it back and you know in this like in the frontier era there was this kind of ethos of like helping one another and that sort of thing and the harmless i think were perceived as kind of not playing the game correctly they were hoarders of money plus they had some weird beliefs, right? They were celibate. They were followers of this weird old man with the beard, right? And they, there was a lot of thought that a lot of travelers remarked that they were basically like, you know, slaves to this fella who told them what to do and they just did whatever. They, it was you know, countering this like this freedom, uh, individuality sort of ethos that was, that was really common on the frontier. And so, yeah, they just ran into a lot of problems, both economically and, you know, I, I've told people before, and I, you may agree with me, Jennifer, that, uh, you know, if the harmonists were around today, a lot of people would call them a cult, you know, that term that's kind of used is for a aberrant sort of religious group or something like that, that has this charismatic leader, right? And there, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors, some strange things going on there. Um, and so there was no a lot of succession plan. Sorry. Um, I mean, there was no succession plan. You know, no. Father Rapp never said Frederick will take over the community when I die. Mm. Um, yeah. And then yeah. Frederick died before he did. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, they eventually carried on, but by the time Rapp died, it was already petering out and they didn't really have any new members or very few new members in uh, it. So, uh, you know, they, they, I, as I know, they did not invest much in the immediate community, but mm -hmm. they were fairly big contributors to Indiana politics. 
um, they were against statehood. I, yeah, I don't know specifically about the statehood issue. So I they do... must have been supporters of uh, Harris, Harrison, who also okay. was not really in favor of statehood. I don't, I don't recall specifically about that. One thing I do know about politics and the harmonists, though, is that there was a lot of, there was some conflict between the harmonists and the locals because it was perceived that the harmonists were voting as a block, that they were just slavishly doing whatever rap told them to. It's like, here, you're going to vote for this one, this one, this one, this one. And then they would be able to sway elections that way. And they thought it was unfair to whomever wasn't, you know, the favored candidate of the harmonists that they had a large chunk of Posey County population at that time. And they were able to, you know, get people elected that they wanted rather than make it a fair election. So I know that was an issue. I, about statehood, I don't remember anything specifically about that. But. Well, I know I've read some things that said they were, they it's were not keen on statehood. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even after statehood, they contributed to political campaigns. Yeah, I don't doubt. Be, they wanted to be left alone. Yeah, they just, they wanted people in place who were gonna give them what they wanted, uh, which was, yeah, basically to be left alone um, and uh, conduct their business without being harassed, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it's one of the reasons why they left, I think. We don't know all the specific reasons, but one of them I don't doubt at all had to do with the fact that they were not getting along well with their neighbors. Yeah, yeah, I think that that was a strong indicator um, as well. Although I guess it's interesting that they uh, did continue to sell whiskey even when they went back to Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, they so. had no problem with whiskey. They were, you know, they were just kind of counting the pennies and what's the bottom line. Um, they didn't smoke, they didn't drink hard alcohol, but they really had no issue with selling things like well, that. Well, whiskey is relatively easy, cheap to produce. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just need space. Yeah, and water. And wood, and we yeah. got lots of wood in this mm -hmm. time period anyway. Yeah, they had two distilleries operating, so apparently they thought it was worth their while to, you know, have production really ramped up. Um, any other questions for Mike? Because I could sit here and talk Harmonious Tavern all night long. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for, yeah. for telling us all about the new Harmony Tavern. And yeah, uh, we have one more presentation for this season, which will be next month. And that is uh, Bill Bartell is going to be presenting on young Abraham Lincoln. Is that correct, Vivian? Yes. I know that I didn't get the correct. title exactly right. And that'll Abe's be our youth, shaping the future president is what was given to me. There you go. Abraham Lincoln, that Indiana boy. Uh, <laughs> uh, inside joke. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And I will be.